Okay, let's hone in on this business about multiple planes of existence and fitting together like a body. I don't know about you, but I always had trouble with the body analogy in 1 Corinthians 12. Because like most people, because I'm human and you're human, if you can do certain things better than me, that there's a, a, a tendency in the human mind to say that you're better than me because some of the things you do are much better than what I do, or vice versa. Okay. And in my particular case, all my life, that whole you're better, you're worse dogged me. I learned to hate it. And you can pretty much talk to anybody you want who's had some kind of success that others admire in their life. And what they'll tell you, if you can get them to talk, he said, it's not what it's cracked up to be. When you don't have something or you feel inferior, you look at some kind of goal that you think, if I got this, I'd be happy, I'd be content, I'd be better. And what you're really looking for is to alleviate your sense of crushing inferiority. So you think if you bought something or got something or achieved something that your sense of inferiority which hurts would go away. And here's the problem. A. It doesn't go away. And B. Whatever it is you achieve doesn't garner for you the kind of satisfaction you expected. Now here's why that happens. That I don't hear anybody talk about. Let's say you really are inferior. So you work and 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 you finally gain your objective. Whatever it is. Good, bad, right, wrong. Doesn't matter. You get it. There is obviously in the moment of recognizing you won a kind of elation, a kind of satisfaction, a kind of, oh, finally, at last, you know. And it might last that whole day, or a week, or let's say at most, maybe, maybe, a whole year. But even if the sort of euphoria and sense of satisfaction lasts that long, not long after that initial enjoyment starts creeping in lots of new problems you didn't even know would exist like, and here's the kicker of it, all the people who were rooting for you to finally win, once you win, all of a sudden they're not so happy anymore. There's a thing like el envy, jealousy, you're different from them now, they feel inferior to you, because they weren't really expecting that. And they don't know what to do with what seems to be the new you. This is especially true if you get a lot of money or a lot of recognition. It, it, whatever your achievement is that you get, it separates you from those who were, as it were, in your own class prior to the achievement. That's not something you counted on happening. It's very distressing because here you are, you're trying to get to this goal and reach it, and you're thinking, oh, I can share this with my friends, my family, you know, they'll all be happy, and, and they think so too, they're rooting you on. You know, some of them are already jealous from the get-go, you can't do anything about those people. But by and large, you're going to have, as it were, groupies. And that's the next problem you have when you get your achievement. Suddenly you've got new groupies, people who adulate you for whatever achievement it is you had. Oh, you're so wonderful, you're so great. Blah, 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 blah. And you can't do anything with that. It's, it's, it, it's uncomfortable. It's like fingernails on a blackboard. And these are people you didn't know before.
because there's something in the human psyche that gains a kind of, I don't know, it's not necessarily vicarious satisfaction so much as, well, I can't achieve it, and somebody I know did, so that's like a substitute. So they, they come to crave and need you, your attention for your achievement, but they know you and they're in your periphery, so they want to kind of like touch you or grab onto you. That makes them feel higher and better because they're in your periphery. Now, I hate to say it, but that's going to be true in the eternal state. It's part of being human. We feel better if we can touch God. See, so it's not even wrong. But if you're the one who's superior, it's like, ee! It's like what the angel said to, to, to John when he did that. You know, was it, uh, what is it, uh, 19, uh, Revelation 19.10, or thereabouts. John falls down at his feet to the angel, and the angel's really just like, ugh! And he says, don't do that! Ugh! You know, because it's like, don't worship me, I'm just me. Now that's the big kicker of this audio. When you get higher, you don't think of yourself as higher. You're living on a new and a higher plane versus where you were before. But the new one becomes your new normal. That's why it it's just, it's you know, people say, well, why is it, you know, I thought I was going to really enjoy myself when I got all this money and fame and success, and now I'm here and it's kind of like, bleh. Yeah, because it's your new normal. The sin nature cannot really enjoy anything, so it has to, like, put it down. And it doesn't have enough width and breadth and height and depth to just wallow in the success. It, it really doesn't know how to enjoy. That's why we're always so miserable. The sin nature is what makes us miserable. It takes away your capacity to enjoy. It's always imposing the me be good, me be good, me be good, energizer bunny, okay? ba 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 Got to keep going, got to keep going. So that's why you hit the new plateau with an enjoyment or a success, and then all of a sudden everything else before that all too quickly becomes something that's just not acceptable anymore. And it's right in a way that it be like that. You're at your, you never sit on your laurels. Okay? And now you've got this new achievement and suddenly it's the new normal. And you being, even when you're humble and especially when you're humble and objective. And not all pig-headed and big-headed about, oh, see how great I am. If you're not thinking that way, then all of a sudden you don't think you're, that much of your achievement you're glad of it you're relieved of it but it's like okay what's next but the problem is is that you are on a higher plane the problem is the people that you used to be around are still on the lower plane this is really important to understand because you will go through this in the spiritual life. Spiritual success is the hardest version of this kind of success that you'll ever have. There are all kinds of different successes in life. Health success, money success, smart success, serendipity success. Even when you find a, a great buy at, at the store. You know, oh, chicken was only 50 cents a pound, one day only. I don't remember when chicken ever was 50 cents a pound, but I'm pretty sure it used to be not too long ago, maybe 20 years ago. Somebody will be jealous that you got chicken at 50 cents a pound. That's, you got to be careful who you even tell. All right. But the point is, is that every success you got puts a kind of floor underneath you so that you can't go back. You're at the new normal. You're on a new higher standard. And those who are at the lower are still there. And in spiritual success, what that means is you're actually learning and living on Bible. You're actually maturing. And it's the hardest kind of success because it's really the most blatant. 
That doesn't sound like it would be true, but it really is. Because it's like, it's like going from being, well, I'll, I'll, I'll just give an example because I'm beginning to find out what that is. It's like having cataracts and not knowing it. I got cataracts. I got to get surgery one of these days soon. Okay. You ha if you are born with cataracts, you don't know you can't see until you get the surgery. And then it's like, oh, wow, <laughs> you know, I can see so much better now, okay? And that's what, spirit, that's what spiritual growth does to you. It increases your IQ, all right, for one thing. Because it has to, because it's, you know, God's thought is supposed to be circle, cycling in you. So one of the byproducts of spiritual growth is that you, you become smarter. That's why everybody thinks I'm so smart. I know the difference between the Bible smarts in me and me by myself, but they can't see inside myself, so they can't tell the difference. And God integrates it so well, they can't tell the difference between me and the doctrine in me. I know the difference because I can hear myself inside. Everybody always says to me, oh, you always have the answers to the questions. They almost hate me for it. And I've been like that my whole life. But it's just, I just know. I just get it. I just understand. I'm not working at it. And I don't consider it to be an achievement. If you're a naturally talented dancer or a naturally talented linguist, or a naturally talented piano player or tap dancer, like Gregory Hines, one of the great tap dancers of all time. But it, for him, I'm sure he worked at it too, but there was a natural talent there. Actors. There's a certain amount of really hard work, and then there's a certain amount of just natural talent. The best of the actors know how to nurture and, you know, develop their own talent. They're aware of the limitations of talent. But it's kind of got to be there. Okay, but it's not there for others. There are some people who really, truly have to struggle to think of anything beyond green, red, breakfast. Seriously. For them to think in in a sentence, in a whole sentence, for some people is really difficult. I don't know what that is, but what I call it in the all these God Deeds audios is the input, throughput, processing of information, and that is chiefly the differential between persons in the eternal state. I talk fast. I throw out a lot of information in an audio. My 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 audios are information dense and a lot of people tell me that they have to listen to it like two three four five six times to understand what the hell I'm saying well take heart I do too but when I'm saying it I know exactly what I mean all that information in the throughput is just well how'd that get here you see what I'm saying? You will have abilities as you grow spiritually that are like that. This is how it works. Your ability to process information because think, God is omniscient. So the, 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 the as it were, the pipe, the diameter of the pipe of God's thinking in Christ's soul had to be bigger than what do you want to call it? It's immaterial, so you can say this and it won't be exaggerating. The diameter of his thinking in his soul had to be larger than, say, the diameter of planet Earth. Divine thinking. That's a qualitative and a quantitative item. The volume of it. Volume as in amount, not volume as in sound. You know, volume as in what's the volume of water that can be in a pitcher. The volume of information. And the faster and the more information you can assimilate in the shorter and shorter periods of time, the more you see the big picture at the same time. 
And what God will do to you as you're growing spiritually is he'll throw, I don't know, as many as six, seven, ten, twenty, fifty verses at you all at once. To give you a sense of what it's like for him to be in. Sometimes it's so much information at once. In the beginning, I remember just, okay, I gotta lie down now. Too much information. We've all said that. You know, your eyes glaze over. It's, it's, you liked it, you wanted it, but it's like, I went right over me. Because it didn't, it didn't, it was too much coming into your ears and your brain couldn't assimilate it that quickly. It's like a rush of water. Throughput. Output. Okay? Processing of information. Quickly or slowly. The more slowly you process information, the more your enjoyment and comprehension is cramped. Spiritual growth is the highest form of wealth there is. Just like the Lord said it was true riches. Because, like true riches, it's huge. It's a lot. I've got it on my refrigerator. The test is that of muchness. That's the test of your spiritual life. Every single day in your life. From the first minute you believe in Jesus Christ, all the way to the day that you die. How much can you assimilate? How much can you process? And it's supposed to get bigger every day. If you're spiritually growing, it does. It's like exercise. You know, you lift your leg once, and if the, if you haven't been lifting your leg for years, that's that's a lot. Doing it five times, can you lift your leg five times? And then maybe you're tired by the time you lifted it three times. Okay, but you keep trying to lift it even three times. And then then you can go to four. Then you can go to five. Then you can go to six. That's the same kind of idea. Tolerance. Okay? Spiritual growth creates that kind of wealth. Where you can see the whole quickly, more and more quickly, and more and more of it, how all the pieces connect. Because remember, omniscience is God seeing everything in its causes, conditions, successions, and relations. That's omniscience. It's like that movie Goodwill Hunting where, you know, Matt Damon was playing the math genius and he was actually working as a janitor. I think it was what, at MIT or it was in Boston. Boston. And he 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 saw the the you know, he was able to read whole books within like half an hour. And he didn't think anything of his talents. And he didn't want anybody to know about it because he wanted to stay with his friends who were living on a lower plane. But he sees a math equation that Stellan Skarsgård's character had written out and he just immediately knows the answer to it. But all of the mathematicians have been trying to solve it for years. But to Matt Damon's character, it was like, oh, I see, blah, blah, blah. That's what the spiritual life does to you. Stuff that has been stumping theologians and scholars in the Bible for years will just be like, oh, that's easy. Why? Because you grew spiritually and they didn't. This is the difference of spiritual intelligence versus, as it were, human intelligence. God keeps depositing. Every time you go to Bible class and you, you know, use 1 John 1 9 and you're listening to your teacher, he deposits, deposits, deposits. Line on line, precept on precept, axon and dendrite. Okay? And then they, he connects them. God connects the dots. And all of a sudden, the picture is like, oh, I get it. Oh, this is, means this and this and this and this and this. And you go, and you have all the answers right in your head. And it takes like, I don't know, two seconds. Somebody else who's not spiritually advanced will not understand you. And that will hurt. Because you're on such a higher plane, you don't realize 
that you're on a higher plane than your fellow man, just like the guy in Good Will Hunting, Matt Damon's character. He didn't think of himself as being better. All he could think of is that if he showed his smarts, he'd lose his friends, and then he'd be very unhappy. Yeah, and that's how you feel as a spiritual adult, too, once you realize this is your problem. You want to know God? Okay, fine. He pours himself into you? Okay, fine. But that puts you on a higher plane of existence. And your friends and your family are way down below. And they won't even understand you when you talk. So you learn not to. Just like Matt Damon's character. What did he do? He wasted his smarts. He hid it at night when he went home. But he went out drinking with his buddies. So he could just be like them. The same thing happened to Israel. And she didn't like it either. It made her feel awkward. It made her feel out of place in the world of nations. They, she says to God in 1050 BC, Oh, give us a king like other nations. That's where Saul came in. And Saul started out real humble too. In fact, he he was the tallest guy in the group. And, and when he finds out, and he kind of already knew because Samuel told him on the side, when Samuel finally makes the, the disclosure that Saul's the king official, Saul goes and hides in the baggage. And they had to go find him. Because he didn't want to think of himself as better. Now that's a clue in the God's own character. And this is the killer of it. God, highest plane of existence, right? He didn't actually think about himself the way we do. He's, um, it's not that it's untrue. It's that it doesn't matter to him. This is the killer thing about him. And I, I don't know. I don't, I, I, I've been shocked about it for so long now. When he looks at his own creation and he looks at himself and he looks at us there's no us them there's no I'm better than you even when he says it that's not how he's thinking about it what he's thinking about and it's really bizarre I love you I want to do for you and the best thing you can do for God is to let him do for you. It's an outlet for him. He wants it. He needs it. That's what the cross meant. It was an outlet. He wanted to have a cost. That's what Hebrews 12 two tells you. Happiness is to have a cost. Because he wants to pour himself out. Now... People who have a lot of money, and they've had it for a long time, not newly rich. That's how they think. The hardest thing for a rich person is to have to just do nothing. I just keep my money, and I do nothing? I can't stand it. See, because the when you're rich, the real value of being rich to a rich person is now I can finally do something about the problems. And I'll tell you who's the most provable character of that notion, Donald Trump. That's why he's running for office. It kind of cracks me up because people say, oh, well, he doesn't represent any special interests. Yes, he does. It's his special interest. He doesn't want anybody else's money because he only wants to represent his own special interest. The question is, is his special interest the same as yours? And frankly, that's the same question you ask any candidate. Yeah, are they bought and paid for by special candidates who are giving millions of dollars? Sure, but that doesn't matter. What matters is, what do they stand for, and do you stand for the same thing? If so, vote for them. It's not a sin to have a special interest. You have interests. You're human. Do my interests and your interests, you know, um, collide? Or do they coalesce? If our interests coalesce, let's work together. If they collide, let's stay away from each other. 
Okay, but that's the problem in spiritual life, is that what was once coalesced turns in the collide, because now you're raising up and up and up in your understanding, in your perspective, in your ability to explain things, in your ability to see things, and that all these other people that were close to you, you still feel close to them. You still care about them the same way, only you're now much higher. And they're lower. But you don't feel higher. You're on your new normal. And you're looking up at God. And you don't feel like you're superior. And the whole idea of superiority doesn't even matter. You know, well, that's how it is with God. The difference between God and us is we aren't aware. And my biggest problem in spiritual life, not being aware of the superiority that the spiritual life creates. He's trying to be real gentle with it and sometimes he smacks me upside the head. You want to know God. That's good. That's wonderful. That's happiness. That's the only way to get real happiness in this life. Okay, but there's a consequence. The consequence is that inside your head, you become superior. You can be a janitor, you can be chairman of the board, you can be any occupation. You can be famous, infamous, not known to anybody but your dog. But you'll still be superior in your soul. And people do notice that. And a whole bunch of them don't like it. And they'll tell you that to your face, sometimes as a complaint. And you won't get it. You'll be like, huh? So this integration of the different levels, one of the problems with it, the thing that, this is always true, whatever is good about X is the same thing that's bad about X. What's good about X? Oh, you're growing spiritually. We'd all say that's good. You're getting closer to God. The only way to get closer to God. Yeah, and then you're getting farther away from everybody you know. And you're on a new normal, a new plateau. So the normal speed and processing of information for you is now way too much for them. Maybe they'll tell you you talk too fast. Maybe they'll say, well, I don't get this. Or hold up, back up. Or too much information. You see? When you see 1 plus 1 delta X and delta T, and then you see the whole end of the equation, and to you it's like ABCs now. Okay, but to them, they lost you back at 2 plus 2. And they have no idea what you just said. They, they feel that somehow you're right, and sort of resent or admire you for being right, but they have no idea what you just said. They can repeat it, but they really don't understand. Now that makes you kind of charismatic too. That was one of the problems my pastor spent a lot of time on. Magnetism, he called it. It becomes sort of magnetic. People want to gravitate to you. And that's a problem because they gravitate to you but they, they don't understand the thing you say. This is somehow, it's sort of magical to be around you. It's sort of magical to ape what you do and ape what you say, but they haven't got the first clue what it is. And because you don't recognize that you're on the higher plane, their gravitation, you don't recognize that for what it is either. And you actually think they understand you. Because they can repeat back what you say. And so you think you're having a real relationship and you're kind of starved for one because you've sort of gotten distant from the people you know. And so now these new groupies that come in, it's like, oh, oh. And you think, oh, I finally found people who understand. And then you start being your new you. And then th once in a while they say something and you realize they never have been understanding you. That's a real shaking disappointment 
Now, why am I saying all this? Because part of this change of plane of existence, the quality of your thoughts due to spiritual maturation, it, it, you're going up the ranks. Okay, I hope you realize that. You're going up the ranks of planes of thinking. And you're encountering people and getting new, new acquaintances and losing old ones. Getting new friends and losing old ones. Getting new, as it were, relatives and losing old ones. But you don't realize the impact of that. But it is happening. And so the blind, the Venetian blind, is slowly being created. And what that really ends up meaning in the end is that you have, you get what all wealth is designed to produce. Happiness and contentment. And that shows too. And that makes you magnetic too. And you're really getting a taste of the whole reason for this is twofold. First, what was it like for Christ to be here? You're going through the same paradigmal experience, the same agenda, the same training mechanisms, everything. Christ was trained by the Holy Spirit in the Word. So are you. Christ was indwelt by the Holy Spirit and trained in the Word. So are you. It's the same, the same setup. That's the first thing you're getting. You're finding out what it was like for him to be here. And all the vicissitudes he went through paradigmally. And the second thing is that this is how it's going to work in the eternal state too. On a much higher level, of course. But this going up the ranks and being higher than everybody you know, eventually. And some will admire it and be groupies. And some will admire it and actually understand one or two things you say. And some will uh, hate you for it. And some will be jealous. And some will be your sworn enemies. And blah de blah blah Okay, well that's, you know, mimicking what people go through when they achieve even secular stuff. You get money, you get friends, you get, I don't know, fame. Because it is true riches. So you literally are going through what Christ went through, paradigmally the same structure. You're literally training for all the same functions and issues that are going to be there in the eternal state. It's not a bunch of people sitting on clouds playing harps. The struggle is going to go on. The difference between today's struggle and the struggle in eternity is we're going to enjoy the struggle then. Today, not so much. Because the old sin nature hampers your ability to enjoy anything. There is such a thing as enjoying struggle. When you really like what you're doing, you even enjoy the struggle. When you really love what you're going after, you even love the pain. Like Christ said in Hebrews 12 too. Like he even loved the cross. He enjoyed it. Kara. Unalloyed happiness. My pastor translated that. Greek kara. Kara. Would be a better pronunciation probably. Okay? So this why of integration is, is you know, probably endless I could probably keep on making audios about it forever but I think I'll just stop now think about it talk to dad in case I miss something